With a title like that, I'd better deliver. There's been some back and forth going on around a particular supplement and its increased risk of cancer coming out of a combination study taking two randomized control trials and pooling the data to identify a potentially cancer-causing effect of vitamin B, specifically vitamin B9, although B6 and B12 were also checked out. The overall study is this one and included almost 7,000 participants with heart disease randomly assigned to consume folic acid, that's vitamin B9, vitamin B6, and B12. So that's one group. The other three groups consumed folic acid and a vitamin B12, or vitamin B6 only, or a placebo, none of the vitamins. Then they assessed cancer mortality rates in these people over six years, although they consumed these vitamins over only three years. So what happened? Nothing. No one developed cancer and died from it. The end. Obviously, some people died from cancer at a greater rate than normal. If we pop open that data, there's cancer incidence, as in the number of cancer cases on top, and we have the actual death from cancer, as well as overall mortality and non-cancerous mortality. We have the four vitamin B conditions up top, including placebo. Then on the right, we have the hazard ratio. That tells us, in a relative sense, if there's an increase in cancer relative to another group. There's two comparisons, so folic acid versus all the other groups, not including folic acid combined, and the vitamin B6 versus all the other groups, not including vitamin B6. Generally, if the values are above 1.0, that indicates increased cancer, but these parentheses tell us the margin of error in the results. For example, although the top right condition, the vitamin B6 versus non-vitamin B6 groups, indicates a 1.07, which is increased risk, the confidence intervals fall below 1 with a 0.92. So we couldn't say that we have detected an effect because we don't have enough precision in the results. On the other hand, if we look at the folic acid comparison, there's several instances of worry, like overall cancer incidence and overall cancer mortality. Cancer cases increase about 21%, and the death from cancer increases 38%. Scary, especially since folic acid is found all over the place, including regular multivitamins. Unfortunately, we likely don't have enough data to tease out which cancer people are most prone to. And as a quick mention, none of the vitamin B6 comparisons indicated risk. So this falls squarely on vitamin B9, folic acid. Okay, so folic acid increases cancer. Sort of. We'll get into my hesitation in a bit, but let's understand what's been proposed by the researchers as to how folic acid increases cancer. They mentioned that folic acid may stimulate the growth of neoplasms. These are abnormal growths in the body, although not always cancerous, but they can often go undetected and folic acid may stimulate cancerous prone neoplasms to develop more quickly. In addition, your immune system is quite adept at eliminating cancerous cells, and it does that through two branches of immunity the adaptive and the innate immune system. One of the first anti-cancerous defense systems is through a group of cells called the natural killer cells. There is evidence that high folic acid exposure can be cytotoxic, meaning it kills NK cells. Here's what's especially concerning about this study. The two randomized controlled studies included were performed in Norway, where food is not fortified with folic acid, unlike many other countries like the USA, where foods are fortified with folic acid. So these people were presumably already consuming less folic acid than people in countries consuming it by consequence through food fortification. In addition, a known carcinogen smoking was slightly lower in the folic acid conditions at baseline. Even so, there are some hesitations about over-interpreting these data, and there's also a strong cautionary tale to tell in relation to stopping folic acid completely. For one, other researchers have pushed back on this study some. For example, they reference other studies like the HOPE study. Maybe they're hoping these results aren't true. Ah, that was a weak one. Anyway, this HOPE study also had people consume folic acid, and although the study wasn't focused on cancer, they did look at cancer incidence too, and they found no relationship between folic acid and cancer. In addition, these participants were in countries where folic acid fortification in food is common. 
So now we have disagreeing takes from randomized controlled trials. How do we reconcile this? Okay, I'm about to go off on a statistical rabbit hole. If you're not interested, skip to this timestamp and we'll get you closer to the main takeaways. For the rest of you nerds, let's discuss. I mentioned that the HOPE study wasn't focused on cancer, and that's outlined in the fact that the cancer was a secondary outcome, meaning they recruited participants to detect a cardiovascular effect, not a cancer effect. In such a case, the statistics nor the amount of data may be sensitive enough to detect a cancer effect if there were one. In addition, the first trial that we went over had a power of a mere 61%, which is very low. That means there is an almost 40% chance of not detecting an effect when there is one. And yet, they still detected a cancer effect. Now, considering that the uh, HOPE study had fewer participants and the Ebbing study, that's the first study, had only 60% power with almost 2,000 more participants, it might be expected not to detect an effect in the HOPE trial. These are educated speculations, but they're certainly plausible explanations for why one study shows an effect and the other doesn't. I should still point out that other critiques of these studies is that they're shorter studies. They're not epidemiological, which means that study can run for 20 or more years. And there's mixed evidence from other analyses on the relationship between folic acid and cancer. Some indicate a mild increase in risk, and some show no relationship or even beneficial relationships. This suggests to me that there may be some mediating factor that we're not taking into account, or something else is going on that we may be missing. But that doesn't mean that we can't get some actionable takeaways here, and they don't involve stopping folic acid consumption, as weird as that might sound in the context that we're discussing. Before that, if you've ever had your MTHFR gene checked, or if you'd like to have a deeper dive into this investigation, you can access the uh, full version of this video that you're watching, including a uh, written research review, the hundreds of other research reviews and videos in my Physionic Insiders membership. Also includes live sessions, uh, private podcasts, and more. Check it out. It's in the description box, and I'd really love to have you there. Okay, so how do we think about all this? Look, if you don't consume folate or folic acid, you are also more prone to cancer. Yes, that's right. Consuming it might increase cancer risk, but not consuming it will also increase cancer risk because it's a critical player in building DNA molecules. As your DNA is damaged and needs to be replaced, which happens all the time, by the way, folic acid allows you to replace those broken pieces. Also, during development, your nervous system requires folate to mature from its early stages, called the neural tube. You also won't be producing mature red blood cells, leading to a lack of oxygen delivery across the body. So yeah, folate of some form is absolutely critical. Now, how do we balance this correctly? Well, the studies that we've been referencing have been using pretty high doses of folic acid, which is more easily absorbed than the naturally occurring folate. In fact, they use double the recommended daily allowance. The uh, RDA for folate is 400 micrograms. So the natural conclusion is to consume enough folate and folic acid to achieve near the recommended daily levels, but not to overconsume for long periods of time, even as short as a few years. I'd also consider paying attention to fortified foods. Most are minimally fortified, so they're well below the RDA, but there are some foods that contribute the full RDA value, like certain fortified cereals, although others have lower levels. I'd also check your supplements. If it's supplied the entire RDA as folic acid, or if it supplies part of it as folate, which is less absorbed. If you generally consume whole foods, you probably don't need to be supplementing anyways, as plenty of foods have good levels of folate, like leafy greens, legumes, asparagus, sunflower seeds, and for meat eaters, liver is especially potent. This is a non-exhaustive list, FYI. If I didn't mention your favorite food, that's because I'm not a listicle. So the takeaway here is one, excess folic acid is linked to increased cancer risk, but eliminating folic acid or folate entirely also leads to serious health consequences. 
Number two, check your supplements and general folate folic acid consumption and try to hit just below or at the RDA of 400 micrograms, depending on if you eat a lot of fortified foods. Moderation is not just key, but especially critical in this situation, except in the context of physionic videos, which you should always overconsume. It's unconfirmed if they cause cancer, but they're a good time at least right here.